everybody. Thanks for joining us here today. I am very happy to welcome back Joel Wolfson. Hey, Joel. Hey, Nicole. How are you doing? Good. Thank you so much for being here. Today, Joel's going to be talking about creative visualization from concept to the final image. And I'm super excited to see what he has for us today. So with that, as you're looking at some more of his images, I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little bit about Joel. There it goes. All right. So Joel is a published or is published internationally, and his roster of notable clients are amazing. It includes Newsweek, L, Seventeen, Houghton Mifflin, and corporate clients such as Apple, AT&T, 3M, United Airlines, and Pillsbury. His technical articles on digital imaging have been translated for use in more than 30 countries, and he has been teaching photography since 1985. He's best known for his artistic images here and his unexpected views of everyday places around the world. And if you're interested in learning more from Joel after this session, be sure to check out his workshops at joelwolfson.com. He offers photography and digital imaging workshops throughout the year at his studio in Flagstaff and around the world, as well as photo guiding and private at workshops. So with that, I will go ahead and give this over to Joel. Let me just switch my screens and we'll get started. Well, welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. I'm thrilled to be back to do another webinar for Topaz. I'm pretty excited about all the stuff that I want to show you today and I hope I can fit it all in. <clears throat> in past webinars, I know some of you have attended those, I've shown how to use uh, some of my favorite Topaz plugins and I've shown how I use them as part of an efficient workflow. Um, once you get a handle on these plugins, the next step is to incorporate these plugins into the visualization process. And what I mean by visualization quite simply is just basically seeing <clears throat> the final image in your mind's eye prior to exposure. So when you're in a cool place or you're shooting uh, portraits of someone or whatever it may be, um, something compels you to bring the camera to your eye. And so what we're usually seeking to do is, is to tell that story, convey that emotion, and try to get the feel of being there. And visualization involves seeing that final image in your mind's eye. Um, I first learned visualization as a teenager when I was learning black and white photography, which is initially all I did. Um, it was popularized by um, Ansel Adams and Group F64. But basically, the whole idea behind visual visualization is if you use that process, it, it will translate into more successful images and essentially achieving your creative goal. Um, it, if you think about it, whether you know it or not, all of you have the ability to do visualization. Um, think about the times where maybe you went to a really cool place, you come back and you look at the photos, and they're maybe not quite what you expected. Um, that right there is sort of an acknowledgement of your visualization abilities because you had something in mind the way you wanted to convey it and even if it didn't turn out quite right, um, that's what you're comparing it to. So everybody has that ability, it's just a matter of practicing that. Um, <clears throat> it, it's like practicing anything else, maybe a musical instrument, you have to practice quite a bit before you become proficient. And really the whole idea is to think about all of the available tools you have, whether it's your camera with exposure and lenses you choose all the way through um, to the other end um, in terms of using things like the plugins I'm going to show you today from Topaz. So um, I'm going to get going here and I have a few different images to show you. I'm going to show you what I had in mind first and then how I got there. So the first image you see on my screen here, and I'm in, I'm in Lightroom, by the way, if, it, if the interface doesn't look totally familiar, um, for those of you that haven't seen Lightroom, and I kind of use that as my digital hub uh, to kind of keep track of all my images and to do a little bit of processing with them in terms of adjustments and that sort of thing. So the first image you see here is a little blasé. It's, um, the, I shot this in Death Valley in Mosaic Canyon, which is a really cool place. Um, we have kind of a bland sky and we have some kind of neat rock formations, but what um, there's, there's a couple things going on here. One is we can't see all the detail in the sky um, and that's just a function of the fact that um, with, the, with one exposure we're not seeing all the information that the camera can gather. Uh, modern digital cameras can capture a huge range of information 
you just don't always see all of it on your screen at once. It's that classic case of um, either seeing the darker areas or the lighter areas, but not all the detail in all the areas. Um, but a lot of that information is there. It's a matter of bringing it out. So right here is what I had in my mind's eye. As you can see, there were very dramatic clouds that day. Um, and in my initial exposure, um, number the, the second part of that is that it's also a raw exposure, and I didn't do anything to it um, other than convert it to PSD so I can use my plugins and show you what I did with it. So I'm going to show you how I turned this one into this one, which is what I sort of had in mind. It's, it's a monochromatic area, um, especially on this day when it's overcast, and so I immediately saw it as a black and white in my mind's eye, and I wanted to accentuate um, sort of the circular feeling and the, and the curves, uh, those swirling clouds and, and the canyon itself, which has a lot of curves to it. I also used a fisheye lens to kind of um, augment that whole feel of the curves. So what I'm going to do first is bring back some of those cloud areas. Now in, in Lightroom over on the right, I have my exposure controls, and this isn't too different from the plugins that Topaz has. So the first thing I'm going to do is bring my exposure down, and as you see, um, when I start bringing the exposure down, I can start to see those clouds. So the detail is, is actually there in my initial exposure. Now, of course, my rocks in the foreground are getting a little bit darker, but I'm not too worried about that because I'm going to correct that and adjust. The other thing I'm going to do is grab this highlight control, which isolates just the highlights. I'm going to bring that down all the way, and that brings out even a little more detail in my clouds. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is the first thing is, is to use Topaz Adjust, which is an awesome tool that allows you to kind of equalize exposure. It truly is adaptive in the way it deals with exposure. So what I've done here is I'm right-clicking on the image. Um, and uh, if you're on a Mac, it's an option click. I am on a Mac, but I set up my right-click button. I go to Edit In. And I am going to use Photo Effects Lab, which is a fairly new product from Topaz. And I talked about Lightroom as being my digital hub, and Photo Effects Lab is a great plugin hub. So I want to pick um, the, uh, to edit a copy with Lightroom Adjustments, because I just put these adjustments for the darker exposure in Lightroom. So it's launching Photo Effects Lab right now, and it should open up that, um, that image right into Photo Effects Lab. It opens it up as a layer. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this product. There's lots of great information on the Topaz website under resources to um, get all the different controls and everything down with this, uh, with Photo Effects Lab. I'm going to show this and Photoshop because it's two different ways of approaching it. The one thing I'll say about Photo Effects Lab is that um, if you don't have the budget for Photoshop, which is a fairly expensive product, and you do have some Topaz plugins, uh, this is a great tool. It gives you a lot of the functionality from Photoshop, the most important of which really is the layers on the lower right. So the layout of this thing is you have presets on the left, which is very common and consistent with the Topaz plugins. Um, you also have some other panels here, like to go to directly into the plugins. You can see I clicked that on the upper left. And that's what we're going to use today. Over on the right, I have some of my controls where I can make adjustments right from within Photo Effects Lab, um, in a, which you know gives me additional versatility in addition to the plugins. So the very first thing I do, and I would do the very same thing in Photoshop, is I'm a big fan of labeling my layers. So I'm just going to call this background, which is the same terminology that Photoshop uses. And I want to maintain my original layer in case I need to go back to my original image. I'm going to duplicate this layer by clicking and dragging it down onto Duplicate. I'm going to relabel that Adjust because that's the plugin I'm going to use to start out here. The reason I like Adjust, and I, I just go over here to the upper left, I say click on Plugin. Now you notice um, I'm going to go back to the lower right here where the layers are. That layer is highlighted, so that's what's going to be affected by whatever plugin I choose on the left. So we'll go into Adjust, and Adjust is that um, has that great feature called Adaptive Exposure. Now again, for those of you that are new to Topaz plugins, they all have a pretty similar layout with presets on the left, 
presets or prefabricated settings, uh, combinations of settings that Topaz has given you so you can check out um, uh, various things. If you go to the classic collection, you know, you can, you, as I mouse over these, you can see up top left there in this uh, thumbnail, you get previews of all of that. Um, the first thing I do when I come into a plugin is I hit reset all in the lower right here so that I start um, at a basic starting point with no effect on the image whatsoever. And, I, and what I'm going to be doing here is pretty simple. The adaptive exposure is the most powerful part of this tool. And basically what adaptive exposure does is it, um, it sort of equalizes the image in the sense you can bring up shadow areas without sacrificing highlights. With a normal exposure slider like you have in a lot of other programs, it literally just brightens or darkens the whole image. So if you bring up shadows, you're sacrificing highlights and vice versa. This one is truly adaptive, which is really nice. So what I'm going to do is bring this up a bit. And this, um, you can see it's already starting to equalize my image. And I'm going to bring this up even more. I think I'll go to probably about 50 here. And you can see this is almost like magic. I've brought up those dark rock formations, yet I haven't sacrificed the highlights and the tones in the sky. Um, the regions work in conjunction with this. And the way to think about regions is it divides the photo up into sections. So if I do one, it's treating the whole image as one section. And adaptive exposure is doing the best it can to sort of equalize the exposure, treating the whole image as one. What's really cool is I, it's like setting graph paper on this and dividing it into a grid. I can add more regions. It will evaluate each one and do the adaptive exposure on each of those regions. And then it combines it all back together, which is really cool. So I'm going to increase the number of regions here. And um, you can see as I, if I go way to the right, it's, it, it kind of makes it a little bit too, um, too low in contrast. So the ideal here is probably right around 15. So that's a good starting point. And really, that's all I need to do in adjust. I'm going to say OK. And that's going to bring my adjusted image back into that layer. So now I have that layer um, where my rocks are looking pretty good. I have a cool sky. Um, and now what I want to do is bring this into black and white effects. Now. I duplicated my layer again for the purpose of bringing it into black and white effects. And I purposely exaggerated the effects and adjust to give me better tonality for the black and white. So now I'm going to go over to my plugins and click on black and white effects. And that should bring me back in to black and white effects. So again, the first thing I do is I like to to hit that reset all and bring me back to a neutral point. Where I often start with black and whites and black and white effects is using the presets on the left and start with classic, which kind of gives me a pretty good starting point overall for black and white. And actually, I really like the way this one looks right off the bat. I really am not going to have to do too much adjustment to this. So I'll go into the conversion, and there's my good friend, Adaptive Exposure, that's also in Adjust. Um, I kind of like to use the one-two punch here. So I, I first bring it to that punchy level in um, adjust, then I bring it into black and white effects. I could try to do the whole thing with adaptive exposure and black and white effects. I've just had better results doing it first in adjust to kind of get my equalization in the way I want it, and then sort of use uh, adaptive exposure in black and white effects to kind of tweak it. So. Um, I'm going to bring, bring the adaptive exposure up a bit just to kind of accentuate what I've got here. Um, and I think the regions are pretty good where they are. I kind of like the way this looks. And I'd say we're pretty much nearly done. This is, this is kind of what I had in my mind's eye. Now, one other thing is I'm going to just go into the uh, finishing touches here. I kind of saw this as a sepia tone. So if I click on the silver and paper tone, I get kind of a sepia tone. It's a little too much for me. I use the tonal strength here to bring it down. What happens in black and white effects 
the silver and paper tone when you check that box the defaults are in the sepia area you can see I can set the silver which is the image information and the paper which is sort of the lighter tones um, the analogy being if it was photographic paper in the darkroom and those are pretty much set to those sort of brownish sepia looking tones and I like it where it is so all I did was adjust the tonal strength so now I have somewhat of a sepia the only thing I can um, see about this that I maybe might want to tweak a little bit is there's a little too much texture in that foreground after using the adaptive exposure a couple of times um, but I'm gonna say okay because I'm not worried about that I can fix it right in the photo effects lab um, I mentioned before one of the cool things is that we have some adjustment tools right within this so again just out of um, habit here and precaution so that I can go back to any point I create another layer I'm going to rename this smoothing and then I'm just going to go up here to the brushes and you notice there's one called smooth and detail um, the brush size and all that is pretty standard in most programs so I won't bother explaining that the strength um, if I go to the minus it smooths it out and if I go to the plus it it enhances detail so I want to go to the minus I'm going to go about halfway and I've got pretty large brush here so I can just kind of sweep through this image and hopefully you can see that it's somewhat subtle but it's it's bringing down that sort of um, noisiness if you will of the uh, of the foreground rocks I don't really want those competing I do want to see the texture and tone but I don't want it so over detailed that I'm competing with my sky I want kind of a nice balance there and this is just a subtle difference that does that and if you look over to the right on the mask those dark areas are where I brushed in which kind of matches the the rock formation what I'll do is I'll go up to one to one here so you can see this and if I uncheck this layer you can see it that's before the smoothing and you can see it's very um, it's almost over detailed and that's with the smoothing I can still see all kinds of texture and tone and detail in there without it being overbearing um, and, and with any of these layers, I can uncheck them and go, go back to any point that I want in my process here. So now that that's done, normally what I'd do is I'd, I'd click OK. It takes a while to process and then show up in uh, Lightroom. I'm just going to cancel out of here because I already did this one before, and I'll just go back to show you the before and after again. So there's where we ended up. Um, there's where we were before and the whole thing took maybe 10-15 minutes um, now what I'm gonna do is show you a couple other examples and with these um, I'm gonna I'm gonna use Photoshop just so you can see another way of doing this um, the way they work with the layers is pretty similar but some of you have Photoshop some of you have photo effects lab or are at least interested in looking at it. so I just wanted to show you all a variety so the next the next image here I'm going to show you and what I did with it is a little bit of a departure from what I normally do photographically a few years ago I started working with a painter doing joint projects where we combine photography and painting and he's an awesome watercolorist a guy named Steve Stento who's um, a really great painter and I sort of had to enhance or, or expand on my visualization abilities to sort of see things as painting uh, so that we could do these combination projects so the reason I'm mentioning all this is the scene you see in front of you is a village in Tuscany uh, where I do a workshop every year I think we've been doing that workshop about five years now and, and over those years um, I've come back to this place a few times and I just like it because it's a neat little slice of life however I don't like it as a photograph and by that I mean it's I don't think it stand, it's not strong enough to stand on its own as just a photograph and I think the reason I figured out over looking at this thing over time is it's very busy it has all the elements I like in that there's these neat little archways in these villages this is in a residential area there's, there's this nice little pathway taking you through to the rest of the town and if you've ever been to Europe you know the Europeans and, and the Italians are no exception you know you have these uh, everything is about presentation so 
they have this little window here. It's got lace curtains, beautiful flowers, potted, you know, the potted plants, the shutters, and everything. And and it and this has just all these little elements. There's also that juxtaposition of old and new. You have modern plumbing and wiring, and this scooter sitting under there. Um, you know, all juxtaposed with these centuries-old buildings. So. To me, there's too much going on here. It's a little too busy. So what I had in my mind was more of a painterly look, which is this. And I just really like this because it gets rid of all the noise, so to speak, and distills it down to the elements. It simplifies it. Hence uh, me using Simplify for this. And that's my main tool is Topaz is Simplify. And I'll show you how I go about that. Um, my first step is to go into adjust my good friend here this time I'm gonna go I'm right clicking I'm doing the edit in I'm gonna do Photoshop this time instead of photo effects lab so I can show you another uh, another way of doing this I'm still gonna be making use of layers um, I wanna mention here in terms of workflow efficiency I've mentioned this in past webinars if I know I'm just gonna use one um, plugin only I will go directly into that plugin from Lightroom. If you're using Elements or some other program, you can go directly into those plugins. If I know I'm going to use one, that's a lot more efficient than going into a separate program like Photo Effects Lab or Photoshop. If I'm using more than one, it makes a lot more sense to use something like Photoshop or Photo Effects Lab and make use of the layers. So there's my layer. I'm going to duplicate it, and we're going to call this Adjust. And the reason I want to use it just as similar to the last image, I kind of want to equalize out some of these shadows without blowing out my highlights and adjust um, adaptive exposure is wonderful at that. I want to be able to see this scooter better and I want to bring down these highlights maybe just a little bit. So I kind of want to equalize this whole thing. I'm going to go under filter. I'm going to go under adjust five. And this will open it up into adjust five. Again, my first thing to do is go to the lower right there, reset all, bring it back to my base level image here. Um, and now I'm going to go into my adaptive exposure, which is under global adjustments on the right. And I'm going to move my adaptive exposure over. And I want to increase the number of regions here. Now, in thinking about the regions, when you have an image that has a huge range of tones in all different areas of the image, um, that's sort of my little rule of thumb. That's when I want to look at using a higher number of regions with a simpler image with fewer differences in tones, you probably using a lower number of regions. And you can always experiment. You know, if I bring this down, down to one, um, it's a little too contrasty. I'm not really seeing much um, detail come up in, in that motorcycle there. So I want to probably, you know, go to a higher number of regions just because I have so many different uh, range of tones in there. So up in the 30s, around 40 is pretty good. You can see I have brought up that scooter. Um, if I do the before, I'm holding down the space bar. That gives me my before image. And I go to the after. You can see I haven't sacrificed any highlight detail, but I've really brought up the shadows. I'm going to end up tweaking this with some layers in Photoshop because although I've um, gotten the exposure pretty pretty good the way I want it, I would I do want to bring up this this scooter a little bit more, and these these panels add nothing to the image. I might want to bring those down a little, and also bring down some of these highlights over here. So one more thing I, I want to do before I leave adjust, and that is um, if, since I'm going into simplify, and I'm going to be eliminating smaller details and just having sort of bigger chunks of information, um, I want to bring up the color. So I'm going to use adaptive saturation to bring up my saturation. And I'll bring that up just a little bit. And that's kind of not enough. <laughs> I'm going to go a little higher there. That's getting more where I want to be, right around 50 there. And I'll probably you know, the regions you won't see as much effect because it's not looking at, at contrast. You can see a little bit when I bring up the number of regions. It's basically just working with um, the, the vividness of the color. So um, the, the difference in those regions isn't as dramatic. So I've got it um, just about exactly where I want it. Say OK. And there's my adjust layer. If I want to see where it was before, I can just 
uncheck that layer by clicking on the little eyeball in Photoshop. We did this also in Photo Effects Lab. Um, there's my after. Um, this is not at all what I want in terms of a final image. We still have to go in to simplify, but this is sort of the color I want, and, and I have to give Simplify something to work with. If, if, I, if I don't give it um, enough detail and, and some of the um, colors to work with, um, I'll have to do more work in, a, in um, Simplify. So I'm going to duplicate this layer by grabbing the layer in Photoshop, um, grab it right here, bring it down to this dog-eared icon, which is the layer icon, and that's how I duplicate a layer in Photoshop. There are other ways to do it. Photoshop, you can go through menus, you can do keyboard commands, um, you can go right within the palettes like I just did. So um, there are always different ways to, uh, to accomplish things in Photoshop, but this is my method here. And I'm going to rename this layer uh, Simplify, because that's where we're going to go next. Actually, I lied to you. I said we were going to do some adjustments first, so let me, um, I wanted to tweak some of the exposure. Uh, we'll go into Simplify in a minute. The um, Adjust layer did a pretty good job, but I think I mentioned these panels and the scooter, so to, to do that, I'm going to create a, go down to here where the adjustment layers are, and I'm going to pick levels where I can adjust exposure, and down here you can see the levels. Um, so I want to rename this from levels one to, we'll call this um, darken highlights, because that's one thing I want to do. So if I want to darken the highlights, I use the output levels over here, and you can see as I move this slider, it brings those levels down, and I'm going to bring them down more than where I want to be. Um, if I try to get it exactly right, I might not get it exactly right, and I have no headroom. So I'm bringing it down lower than I want. Well, now the image looks terrible, but that's okay because I'm going to click on my mask icon here. I'm going to go up to the edit, and I'm going to fill that mask with black. And what I'm doing, what a mask does, is it covers up everything if it's solid, black like you see here. And then I can selectively reveal those adjustments I just did with the levels by brushing the mask out. So anything that's pure white shows the effect, anything pure black hides it, just like a mask on your face. The cutouts, you see your eyes and your mouth, the rest of the mask covers you up. Um, so it's kind of, a, kind of a literal example here, but it works. So I go over here, I grab my brush, and I check down here to make sure on the le lower left here that I have white in the foreground, and that's going to allow me to just brush in my effect. So I, I'm starting on the street here and some of these highlights and bringing those down. And you notice it's not bringing them down as far as I did before, and that's because if you look up here, the opacity of my brush is set at 40%. That's my favorite starting point because I can, as I keep brushing, I can brush more and more of that in. So I'll give you an example over here with these panels. When I brush in at 40%, it doesn't really darken enough, but if I keep running the brush over there, it gradually gets it darker and darker. And if I want, I can go up here, change the opacity of brush to 100%, and then go back in here, and I'm getting the maximum amount of darkening for that area, which I want to darken more than the rest. I'm going to create another adjustment layer now, now that I've got that the way I want it, do another levels layer, and I'm going to rename this one uh, Light and Scooter, which is what I want to do next, and we're going to use the exact same technique. Um, only here, um, we're trying to um, lighten things instead of darken things, and you see as I move this to the left, I'm lightening it. Now again, this is more than I really need, but that's okay because I'm going to use that 40% brush to gradually bring it back. So first thing I do is say fill uh, under, whoops, first I have to select my mask. Sorry about that, folks. This outline tells you what, you, what you've selected. So I need to click on the mask, make sure I have the outline on it so I have the mask selected. Now I can go ahead and fill that with black. So now we're back to no effect from that, and I can brush in the lightning on that scooter. Whoops, I'm, uh, I'm at 100%. I like to start out at my roughly 40% there, so you can see I can gradually bring that scooter back in. 
and that's pretty good. I go over it a few times to get it where I want it. And now what I want to do is go into simplify, now that I've tweaked that exposure. I want to do a combination of this whole stack of layers. If I were in Photo Effects Lab, I just click on stack. For this, for Photoshop, they call it merge visible. So I go back to my menu, and before I click on this menu, I'm going to hold down the option key, which is Alt on a PC, option on a Mac. And the merge. The reason I do that is when I click Merge Visible holding the Alt or Option key, um, it will create a new layer, merging all those layers into one. And this is going to be my Simplify layer, which is my last step in this process to get where I want to be, which is what I had sort of visualized in my mind, that sort of painterly look of this image to kind of simplify everything, both, both literally and the name of the tool here. So let's go back up to Filter. Topaz Labs, I'm going to go down to Simplify 4. That's the newest version. I still have my older version on there, it looks like. And we see that familiar interface. Again, I reset all. And for the, um, for the Simplify part of this, uh, I go into my Global Adjustments. I go into Simplify. And the main thing I'm going to use, actually, is just the um, mainly the simplify size, and then I um, see if I want to do any tweaks from there. What this does is the higher the number, basically the bigger, the, the less fine detail you have, the less detail and treats information as sort of bigger chunks, if you will. So as I move this over, um, it's, it's going to, you can see it's sort of starting to get rid of that detail as I move this over. And we're getting there, but that's still not quite enough. I really kind of want a real painterly thing. I really want to um, distill it down to just sort of my essentials. So I'm going to move this up to maybe in the 30 range. And yeah, that looks great. I really like where that is. Um, and that's almost where I want to be. The only thing I really see here is that my colors are a little bland. So if I go into adjust down here in the lower right, you notice I have some. Um, saturation controls. And what I'm going to do here is um, bump my saturation up. Now you notice I have saturation and saturation boost. Saturation is kind of the overall saturation and then saturation boost will boost the less vivid colors to being more vivid without affecting the ones that have already kind of gone vivid. So I go, I'm pretty light-handed on this first control and you don't see a huge difference there, but when I move the saturation boost, you'll see a bigger difference. Give it a second to process there, and there we go. I'd say that's our final image. I can say OK. And it takes a while to, um, for Simplify to process that. It's actually processing quite a bit of information. I think what I'll do, since I've already done this one, is I'll just, um, it, it, you'll see a pop-up in Lightroom, but I'm going to go back into Lightroom, and um, sorry, it'll, it'll show up in Photoshop because that's where we were. Let me go back there, and when it's, when it's done processing, you can see it's still processing. It'll pop back into Photoshop. We'll go back and take a look at that, but I, I pretty much already have it pre-done pre here in Lightroom, so you can see that's what I had in my mind's eye. This is where we started, and this is where we ended up. I just got my little beep, so it's showing that it's done in Photoshop. And here's all those layers that we did. So if I remove the Simplify layer, we're back to um, what we did with Adjust and those layers, and we can go all the way back to our, our first image here, layer by layer. And we see that net result back here in, in Lightroom. There's our before. And there's our after. Now, let's see. I think I can squeeze in one more image in just a couple minutes here. Um, and I'll be making use of several plugins for this. Um, this again was on our workshop in Tuscany. And this is uh, San Antimo, in, uh, which is a, a neat monastery, uh, an abbey in, uh, in Tuscany, where, they, where the monks still do Gregorian chants. Um, very cool. Uh, structure photographically. It's very monochromatic, so I definitely saw this as a black and white. And I really like the candles there as my foreground element, <clears throat> kind of framed by all those arches, and it's sort of the warmness of these candles against the kind of um, starkness of the architecture and all the stone inside this thing. 
Um, <clears throat> so this is how the camera rendered it as a raw, what the raw file kind of looks like, and again, kind of bland. And if you're there seeing it with your eyes, once your eyes adjust to the darkness in the abbey, you see a lot more detail in the shadows because that's what our eyes do. They adjust. But the way I saw this in my mind's eye is this image. And here we're accentuating those candles sort of framed by the architecture. And I'll show you, I'll show you how I got there. So the first thing we want to do with this image um, is, again, bring it into adjust. I like to start there. We have a real broad range of tones there, and I want to equalize those out. And we have that, that magic control called adaptive exposure. And so we'll bring that into Photoshop. And again, I, I like to always work on duplicate layers so we can maintain our original layer. And now that we're familiar with adjust, I'll go right in there to adjust. Again, reset all so that we start from our original image. And with this one, I'm just going to do some uh, quick adjustments with the adaptive exposure. What we're trying to do here is boost the darker and shadow areas while, while maintaining our highlights without blowing them out. And that's sort of the magic of adaptive exposure. So um, I want to bring that up even more. I think uh, probably in the 30 to 35 range is going to be good. And that's looking pretty good. We've got already brought back a bunch of uh, a bunch of detail in there. Um, I'll play around with the regions a little bit and see see where we go with this. Now if we go to one, you can see there's too much contrast. If we go all the way to the other end, it's almost a little too bland. So again, somewhere in between. Um, yeah, I want to have a little a little bit of contrast in there, so I'm going to kind of go to the lower end here, maybe around 12 or something like that. So I still at least have a few highlights in there, but I'm not blowing them out, and everything's pretty equalized. Um, again, I like to kind of overdo the color image if I'm going to convert it to black and white. I like to start with um, an extra punchy image just because it gives us that that better tonality and uh, gives a little more tonality and contrast, which is what black and white is all about. So I'm also going to go into color here, and I'm going to take up the saturation um, a little bit here. And I think what I'll do is um, we'll just bring up the adaptive saturation just a little. We don't need a ton here. And that's fairly gaudy, but that's okay. That's kind of what you want to start with to go into the black and white. So we have our kind of um, somewhat gaudy, but again, we have a lot of the shadow detail in here that we want. I'm going to duplicate that layer, and that's going to end up being our black and white effects layer to make it into a black and white. Go into my filters. We'll go into black and white effects. That'll bring up the black and white effects plugin again. Reset all. Bring it back to our neutral point. And um, like I said, I like to start with classic because that's often a good starting point. So yeah, it looks like there we go. So my classic is actually very, very close to what I want here. It's, it's, um, we've got a lot of nice contrast in there, yet we're not um, blocking up shadows or, or highlights. And um, I might just tweak this a little bit with adaptive exposure. So here's adaptive exposure. And I'm going to try bringing up the adaptive exposure a little bit. Let's try that, round 35. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, now, what I'll point out with my cursor here is I'm getting a little bit of, a little bit too hot, much of a hot spot on some of these pillars in here. And so what I'm going to do is increase the regions. Remember, um, increasing the number of regions, it, it isolates uh, to more areas, and so it kind of equals it out a little more. I'll bring it up a little bit. 
Kind of a subtle difference, but it took a little bit of that contrast out, and we're just about where we want to be. The only, the only other thing I would want to do to this image, since the arches are such an important part of this composition, I really want to bring out the texture and detail in those bricks. So I could do that. Um, I could do that using detail here, but this detail control in in um, <clears throat> black and white effects and also in adjust is a fairly broad range tool, and sometimes it works. But I really, if you have topaz detail, that really allows you to tweak it. So I really prefer using that because I can isolate which detail I'm working on a lot more effectively than I can uh, with the detail controls in adjust and black and white effects. So, um, and I kind of want to do that. I want to try to really tweak it on those bricks. So I'm going to, again, duplicate my layer over here in the Layers palette, drag it down to that dog ear icon that duplicates my last layer. So this is a, a progressive thing that we're doing here. And I'm just going to call this Detail, because that's going to be my final step here. Again, go over to Filter, down to Topaz Labs, go down to Detail 2, which is, I believe, the current version of Detail. Um, Detail does, there's a lot of information to analyze in the, in the image in terms of enhancing and sharpening all the different details, so it takes a little while for it to analyze the image. Once it does it, I'm going to hit that, um, that reset all so I can get back to a neutral starting point. So there's the starting point of my original image, and, and the bricks are kind of medium, so they're going to be medium to small in terms of detail. Now if you look over on the right hand side, What's cool about this um, detail plugin is it isolates small, medium, and large detail. And then when within each one of those, I can adjust not only the detail, but the, the boost. And what the boost does, like if we're talking about, let's say, medium detail, it'll, it'll boost the, um, uh, the less evident medium detail. And, and you can always put your, hover your mouse over there, and it says right there that it'll um, boost or suppress the intensity of the weaker medium sized detail, same with the small and the large. So mainly I'm going to be working with the medium detail here and to a lesser extent um, the smaller detail. And I'll, I'm again going fairly light handed on this because the boost will bring it up even more. And what I and, and you probably didn't see a whole lot going on there until I until I bring up this boost and you'll see that when I um, when I boost that, uh, let's bring it up here a little bit, um, you'll see a lot more detail pop out of there. And what I'm looking at, it, it, it's looking pretty bad on these pillars, and that's okay because we're just going to brush it back in using a mask. Um, what I'm really looking at is the arches. So we kind of have to mentally ignore the rest of the image, look at the arches, a little bit in the candles because I want to bring some back in there too. If I hold down the space bar, you get the before. I let go of it, you get the after. So it's popping that detail in the arches just a little bit. I'm going to add a little bit more with the small detail here. Um, and on the small detail, again, pretty, pretty light amount, and it'll, it'll get enhanced a little bit more when I, when I go to the boost here. And I'll boost that up just a tiny bit, maybe around 10 or so. And that kind of, that kind of tweaked it. We can look at it at one to one. And you can see the bricks in here. And if I hold down the space bar, that's before. I let go of the space bar, that gives me my after. Um, I'll fit the image in again. So, so we're pretty good. I know the rest of it looks bad, but like I say, we're going to take care of that because we're just going to selectively brush back in the detail for those arches. So you remember before we created that mask for the layer and we filled it with black. There's a little shortcut to that. If you hold down the Option key on a Mac, Alt on a PC, click on the, the add layer mask icon here, it instantly gives you a layer mask all filled in in black. And again, I'm going to check that my opacity up here is around 40% for the brush. I'm going to increase my brush size just a little bit here. And I'm going to selectively start brushing back in the detail on this. And again, the more swipes I do across with this brush, since I'm at a lower percentage, um, the more detail I'm going to bring back in there. So I'm just going to go through here. Um, on the arches, I'm going to bring back a little bit on these candles in the foreground because those are an important part. And, and so you see, I, I, I'm not, I don't have all that um, extra sort of 
overdone detail on those pillars that I had when the whole thing was exposed in there. So you can see the mask I have over here on the right. The, the gray and white areas are either partially or fully bringing that detail back in and the rest is blocked out. So again, I can do my, my before and after here. I'll just unclick that. And if you look, look up in the arches here, when I click it back on, you can see it brings up some more detail. If I increase the magnification a little, uh, you can see that even more evident. So with the layer off, there's the arches um, with the layer on. So now I've pretty much got my image exactly the way I want it. And we can head back in to Lightroom and do our final comparison. Here's the before, and voila, there's the after, the one that I kind of envisioned to begin with. So um, three images, a lot of plugins, Photo Effects Lab. Um, over here, we started with this dark image, ended up here, which is what I saw. Uh, the, the scooter, the little slice of life scene in Tuscany, we ended up with more of a painterly image. And then the Abbey we just did, this was our starting exposure. And this is where we ended up. So I'll turn it back over to you, Nicole, uh, for any questions I can answer. Thank you so much. We've had a ton of comments. Everyone's really enjoying the tips you've been given for the, for the plugins. A couple easy ones for you first, Joel. OK. Uh, I Phyllis, like easy ones. <laughs> <laughs> Phyllis asked if you were using a tablet. Uh, yes, I am, Phyllis. I use um, I use one made by Wacom. I, I really don't know whether they pronounce it Wacom or Wacom. It's W-A-C-O-M. Um, I've been real happy with their tablets. I use one of the smaller ones so it doesn't take up a lot of desk space. But the tablets are just really great when you're trying to do precise brushing, especially all those things I just showed where I'm brushing it in, um, you know, selectively adjustments for exposure or detail or whatever it is, it's, it's just really nice to have that tablet. Okay, Hope great. that answers the question. Definitely. Um, let's see here. We had quite a few people asking when you were showing your workflow of uh, taking, going into levels and taking the image brightness down or those levels down um, and then doing the mask, a lot of people were saying, can you do the same type of thing and using dodge and burn brushes? Yes, you can. Like like a lot of things with these tools, that you know, there's there are several ways to do it generally, especially especially in Photoshop. Um, but basically, with all of the tools, there are different ways to do it. Um, the the dodge and burn, you can sort of just brush in lightness and darkness. Um, I kind of like the masks because I feel I get more precision. And if I if I overdo it, I can I can just switch the color of the brush back to black, and start start backing it up. So I can I can reverse it in increments as well as go forward in increments. And that's my main reason for using masks, whether it's Photo Effects Lab or whether it's Photoshop. Um, I I just it's just a personal preference thing, really. Okay, thanks. Um, and several people had sure. asked. Um, including Pete, uh, how you sharpen your images? <clears throat> That's a very good question, Pete. Um, sharpening is, is a really important thing. First of all, most digital cameras have a filter in it, which is meant to take out um, interference patterns that you can get. Um, uh, they sometimes call them the mosaicing filter, low-pass filter. But it, it softens your image. So, the, so there's actually a sharpening workflow, believe it or not. So the first thing you want to do with an image, the only, only camera I can think of that doesn't do that is Leica. Um, but every other camera has these filters. So the first thing you want to do is bring back your sharpness. So that's called capture sharpening. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I will use Lightroom for that. I'll try it first and see how it works. If not, uh, sometimes I might use something like detail. Um, as I mentioned before, detail allows you to really tweak the detail. What um, what sharpening in Lightroom or even Photoshop does is um, there's masking built in. So you can, um, let's say you have a landscape, you can mask out the sky where you have a totally even tone and you don't want to introduce sharpening to it as opposed to the foreground where you do. Um, 
And then the, the next step in, in sharpening workflow is called creative sharpening, and we just did that with this monastery where we selectively sharpen certain areas of it. And then if you're going to print it, actually no matter what output you're doing, whether it's to the web or otherwise, you kind of do an over, overall sharpening. I mean, this is a whole other topic, but this is, this is the three-minute or 30-second version, um, is that there's really a sharpening workflow I use. So I do capture sharpening on every image to bring it kind of, kind of bring back the details lost in the camera. Um, I do creative sharpening as needed, and then it, when I print or whatever I'm going, whatever my final output is, whether it's a printing press or the web, I do the appropriate sharpening on that. Thank you. That was a great I explanation. That, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I hope yeah. that answers. Probably more than you wanted to know, Pete, but it's a great question. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. We've had tons of great comments, Joel, about all of your information that you've presented here today. And we just love hearing all of that. So we'll definitely try and get Joel back. Thank you so much. So thank you, everybody, so much for coming. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day or evening or morning. And hopefully you're able to join us again soon.